Okay, um, so yeah, I, I'll try to keep this, you know, in about an hour or under an hour. But um, since um, Alexi first said uh, he wanted to chat a bit about uh, threading in, in Ruby or in general as well, uh, it, it can be a bit tricky sometimes, right, to, to, to think about it because especially with Ruby, we have all of these complications uh, because of the GBL, which I'm going to talk about a little bit. So I thought I might, might make sense to just yeah get together and look at it uh, again together. So just as a disclaimer, like this is all based on just me poking at things. So uh, I'm not an authority on Linux, the Linux uh, task scheduler or P threads or or even the Ruby VM. So just just keep that in mind. But um, I, I try to just share what 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 I thought I took away from you know playing around with. Uh, Ruby and um, the task scheduler and, and, and go from there. Yeah, and Alexia, you also had a couple of specific questions. So, so you can just throw them in whenever whenever you think the is the right time. Because I, I first want to do this kind of like bigger like breakdown of what's even going on, if that makes sense. And then we can uh, look at um, all of the more specific questions. Is that all right? Yep. Great. Cool. Uh, Nicola, uh, I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna mute you just while I'm uh, talking, but Unmute yourself if you have a question. All right, uh, so let me share my screen. I'm just gonna, th this is not a presentation, right? I, I'm just going to, uh, I took some notes mostly for myself. So I'm just gonna share those with you and I scribbled um, a bit of an overview as well. Uh, maybe that will help to understand, understand this all better. I'm just gonna show my desktop here. Yeah, so, um, I think it's important before we talk about, like, um, to actually clarify what we're even talking about. Because, um, so first of all, I'm going to focus only on Ruby 2.7, uh, and we know that uh, some of these things have changed, right, with Ruby 3 because of rectors. So I, what I looked at was uh, Ruby 2.7, and also if you look at older Rubies, you will also find that um, things that I might be touching on uh, are not the same. So, so that can add some confusion. Uh, because I, I found that when you look at I don't know, blog posts, even books or or like documentation you find online, even even those linked from the Ruby website, uh, they are wrong, <laughs> like how they describe how some of this works, uh, because it's just some of them are like ten years old or older. Um, yeah, so so that's something uh, to keep in mind. Uh, and the second thing is that uh, Ruby has actually multiple threading models, if you will say, if you can say that. So I. Uh, I copied uh, out the description of what we're going to talk about, which is called model two, uh, which is the one where um, uh, a Ruby thread is actually mapped to uh, like a system level thread running in a kernel, right? So it has like under, it has different uh, uh, models that it uses for concurrency, like fibers um, that can run concurrently on the same thread. Uh, so we're not going to uh, talk about this. And it has a few others that I'm not going to go into. Uh, yeah, so so basically, and I, th I thought it's also kind of funny because I mean the first thing I tried to do when under trying to understand uh, Ruby threading model a bit better was to yeah look for documentation and and as I just mentioned I found it was quite outdated or um, uh, on the side of the Ruby documentation itself very sparse right so so this is pretty much this is most of what I found like there there, there was a little bit in. Uh, the Groovy guide to writing C extensions, but it was also like, you know, a paragraph basically, um, which, you know, doesn't really help that much. Uh, yeah, so I, I thought like um, this could be useful as well um, um, for you. Save you some time <laughs> to uh, chase down these things as well. Okay, uh, so basically, uh, I think what makes it a bit different when talking about Ruby and also similar languages, I think Python also might uh, have like a similar execution model or other dynamic languages. But um, what I always thought what makes it a bit tricky to wrap your head around threading in Ruby is because we basically, uh, we have uh, scheduling happening on two different levels, right? So we have, uh, so if you forget about Ruby for a moment, um, every process you run. Oh, but I should also say, I'm only talking about Linux. I have no idea how any of that stuff is implemented in Windows. Uh, <clears throat> that's That will be important later as well when I touch on all the, the pthread specific stuff. So um, so this is purely talking about Linux. So so if you, if you run a process, you always have at least one thread uh, uh, that the Linux kernel needs to schedule, right? Lin Linux actually calls it a task. Uh, 
Um, and uh, you can have more than one thread per process, right? So then we need to somehow uh, kind of rotate between them so that uh, every thread eventually will get a chance to run. Uh, so that stuff can get very complicated as well. Um, uh, but um, just so forgetting what the Ruby said for a moment. Um, so this is like kind of a high level overview. You can see this diagram, yeah? Right, so if you look at the right side, like I said, we can kind of split this into kind of the user space, which is Ruby, which, you know, Ruby is just an application as well if you run like any other application. So it's a process uh, which runs threads, right? Uh, so from the perspective of the Linux kernel, there's nothing specific, uh, not, nothing special about that. And so uh, what the Linux kernel does is it, it runs a scheduler, um, I think as a two point, uh, Ruby, uh, sorry, <laughs> Linux, uh, that's gonna confuse me a lot, Linux 2.6 and Ruby 2.6. So um, as of Linux kernel 2.6, um, it is called the completely fair scheduler. That's the scheduling algorithm for uh, how you can divide <clears throat> CPU resources into time slices between different threads that are competing to run, right? Because there might be hundreds of thousands of threads um, you may want to execute. Some of them being Ruby threads, but they will also compete with like kernel level threads uh, or any other application that runs on your system, right? And on the high level, how that works is you have a bunch of CPUs and uh, what the scheduler does is it defines uh, run queues per CPU where, um, yeah, end queues, uh, these threads that request um, or tell the uh, a Linux kernel, I, I would like to run, right? So that there are different states like a thread can uh, go through because it might be doing different things. It might also be kind of waiting on something. You know, it could be blocking on a condition that will become important when we talk about the GPL uh, or it could be sleeping, um, which basically is also a form of condition because you're kind of basically waiting for a timer to expire. Right. Or you could be doing I.O., right? So in that case, uh, your thread is parked and because it needs to wait for some hardware device, you know, like the network uh, making data available to the kernel. And then at some point, the kernel will tell you, OK, here's like a TCP buffer or something that is now um, uh, a full that you can actually process and then, uh, the thread will wake up and uh, actually process this. So there's a lot going on at this level, right? <clears throat> um, and what the scheduler then does is it tries to uh, yeah, decide, uh, well, first of all, which threads are actually runnable. And, and those that are runnable, it, it will put in these run queues. Uh, and they are ordered by, in, in this uh, completely fair scheduling uh, algorithm, they're ordered by uh, the least uh, accumulated CPU time, right? So it, it, it kind of, those at the front of the queue are always the ones that um, haven't gotten kind of enough uh, runtime compared to other threads that may want to run. So, so that eventually, uh, I guess the idea is that it kind of averages out, right? So that you do not starve because that, that is one of the problems, right? That um, if, we, if you wouldn't do that, uh, if you would only like um, schedule based on thread priorities, for instance, right? You, you can also assign a priority to a task. That's a hint to the kernel scheduler to tell it, um, give this, like make sure that this ends up running. But if you, if you then do that and you have a couple of misbehaving um, uh, tasks uh, that would just take away all the CPU time from something else that then might never run, right? So, so there's a lot of like um, complexity uh, behind this that that I also cannot give any more detail on on that. This, but that's kind of a high level of how it works. So, so each of these threads will eventually get a, a time slice assigned, and uh, I believe they can be variable. It's, it's not not a fixed amount as far as I I know, um, and they uh, will yeah. There will there are counters in the kernel they which keep track of how much uh, CPU time a uh, task was being allocated so far and yeah and it makes sure that um, this is kind of balanced um, between. Uh, so this also makes it obvious hopefully that um, because we have multiple CPUs and multiple run queues we can actually like literally like physically run things in parallel right so. Uh, that's kind of what multitasking is, is all about. Although even multitasking, it could be uh, kind of an illusion, right? Because things can appear uh, to happen at the same time, but may maybe you just switch between them very quickly, right? Even if you only have like one CPU. Um, so, so that's the whole the, uh, difference between concurrency and uh, parallelism. But, um, uh, but generally, uh, if we have multiple cores, we can always do more than one thing at a time. So, and this is where it gets confusing with Ruby because for Ruby, that is not really true. Um, so, so uh, well, actually, any, any questions so far? Does, does that make sense? All right, so uh, if we then go to the Ruby side, uh, it, it gets in, a bit more interesting because 
uh, and, uh, you know about it already. Uh, what, well, actually, maybe let's start from the top here to really understand what, what's going on. What's going on here? So, um, uh, because you might be asking, okay, so Ruby, Ruby is just an application, right? Any like any other application, it just happens to be an application uh, that can scan these, uh, you know, dot rb files and re read it, read in a syntax tree, and then it compiles that into a bytecode language, and then it, it runs that. But but other than that, it's from the perspective of the OS, it's just a, just an, an application that needs to execute, right? Um, so it needs some kind of capability to tell the operating system uh, how to schedule threads, right? And uh, on different platforms, you can do you you will do that using different uh, libraries. And I'm not sure how it's done on on Win32, but Ru Ruby has for uh, for Darwin, Windows, and Linux, it has different uh, threading implementations, right? So uh, so at some point there is some abstraction on top of this, up, of course. So but but un under the hood. Um, uh, the these uh, the VM internal threading functions they are implemented differently on all of these different platforms and and on Linux uh, it uses uh, POSIX threads or the pthreads library uh, that's just a C library it's open source you can look at it um, and it, that, that, and pthreads has, has all of these basic um, uh, has all this basic functionality like uh, create a new thread you know attach a priority to a thread uh, or move it between states I, I believe you can tell it like uh, which state it is? Uh, it has um, uh, concurrency primitives like locks, right, uh, to allow you to create new taxes, um, uh, things like that. Condition variables, which is important for the GBL, as we'll see soon. And and Ruby uh, uses pthreads for its own threading implementation. <clears throat> yeah. So so anything you interact with at a Ruby level, like if you write Ruby code like thread.new, like under the hood, this will call uh, into libpthreads and uh, uh, create, a, create a new thread, which then works its magic. I don't, like this, like this arrow here that I don't know what, what happens there. You can, you can go have a look <laughs> yourself, but uh, it, will, it will tell the Linux kernel, hey, I want to uh, create a new task. Yeah, so that, that's the high level. Um, uh, let me go back to, to my notes though, uh, so that I don't get totally lost. Um, yeah, so I mentioned this, uh, that's pthreads. Um, Oh, by the way, because this might be uh, confusing. Uh, uh, you sometimes see the term gil being used instead of GVL. I think that's just like an artifact because prior to, I think it was Ruby 1.9, uh, Ruby was a fully interpreted language, right? So there was no bytecode. Uh, the, this bytecode based engine called YARV that was, I think, added in 1.9. Before that, like Ruby would literally like walk your uh, AST, right? And, and run those things, those like, uh, no, it's as it encountered them, which was not particularly fast. And, and at the time, I think it only had um, what you call green threads or user level threads, uh, where, where there was really only a single Ruby thread and everything had to be multiplexed into this thing, single Ruby thread. So that's not a thing anymore. Uh, and back from the at the time, there was already a thing called the global interpreter lock, but they, they don't call it that anymore because, I mean, I guess there's still an interpreter in the sense that you need to convert Ruby syntax into bytecode, but um, that's not what you lock on. Uh, if you look at the Ruby code as well, there's a data a C data structure which is represents the VM, and it has like a, a pointer to the current execution context, uh, uh, which you need to preserve, right? If if you if the Linux uh, scheduler schedules between threads, uh, it needs to take one thread off of its CPU and put a different one on. So there's always state you need to preserve, right? So because if you put it back, uh, if you put it back on the CPU, uh, you need to know like where the execution stopped last time, right? Uh, that's called context switching. Um, right, uh, so, but you might be asking, so why do we have uh, the global VM lock, right, is what it's called. Uh, <laughs> I found this cheeky quote, uh, which, you know, it's like, <laughs> it's cheeky, but basically, uh, I think there's a lot of truth in it, which is, uh, for you, the GBL is bad, except if you're working on interpreter or using the interpreter as documentation. Um, and, and the reason they say this is, uh, basically, the main benefit of having a global VM lock is not for your benefit, but it just makes it easier to build a virtual machine because if that wasn't the case, uh, then everything within the Ruby VM itself, uh, because the Ruby VM calls into its internal routines all the time, right? So if you, if you have a Ruby instruction, uh, like a method definition or a call into a method, this gets translated uh, into, um, into a bytecode instruction and the VM constantly interprets these bytecode instructions, right? And these are just mapped to uh, Ruby functions and the uh, C functions in, in the Ruby VM. So, uh, so basically, the Ruby VM constantly calls itself, right, while it runs your 
uh, program. So that needs to, if that doesn't happen in a thread safe way, if that if that could happen within the same process for multiple threads that ex execute totally different parts of your program, um, that would obviously lead to problems, right? So that this means and, and Ruby maintains a bunch of global state as well. So uh, so this is kind of difficult, right? And and I mean other VMs do that, right? So they took the hard path. So like the Java VM. Um, is implemented in a way that as a user, there's no global VM lock in Java, right? It also interprets by code, but you don't need a global VM lock, um, which is why uh, Java programs at the thread level are fully dis distributable and parallelizable um, because the VM itself uh, is written in the thread safe way. <clears throat> so, but but this is this is maybe a bit of a um, yeah cheeky comment. Uh, uh, there are there are some benefits to you as a developer because it can mean that running Ruby code uh, in multiple threads can lead to more predictable results, right? If you because because like no Ruby thread can uh, uh, lock the VM at, uh, simultaneously, so that you always have like one Ruby thread execute Ruby code uh, at the same time, and obviously this leads to more predictable results. But I I, I would say that's like if if you if you still then would you can't really assume this to be the case, right? If you because there actually, if, if you look at this, uh, if you look at this link, um, you can uh, do that later on. There's an example of uh, how you can write a Ruby program that yields, uh, which is multi-threaded, that um, produces different outputs based on which um, uh, uh, Ruby implementation you run it on, right? So, like we're using MRI, and that's all I'm going to talk about. But there is also JRuby, right, which um, implements the Ruby language on top of the JVM. And uh, on JRuby, that program would actually produce a different output uh, because the threads do run fully in parallel, uh, and, and that's kind of kind of interesting, right? And and I think it this is actually kind of bad for a developer because it gives you this false sense of um, uh, security, right? Because you might think. Oh, that's how it should be, right? I get this predictable order of uh, the order of executions, even in the presence of uh, concurrency. But actually, if you move your Ruby program uh, to a different VM, which is also kind of Ruby compliant, uh, suddenly that's not the case anymore. So I think that's actually, in my book, that's a design flaw in Ruby. And I, I know Matt's um, uh, always said, well, it, you know, it, it keeps things simple, and to to an extent that is that is true. But um, I, I I don't know, I. I Anyway, like we don't have to dwell on this. It's, it, it is what it is. Um, I guess there's pros and cons to this, but but that's kind of the reason why the GVL um, exists. Right. Um, yeah. So may, maybe a little. There's a little uh, kind of footnote here, which is that um, that a thread may actually run without holding uh, the GVL to perform perform other tasks. Uh, you can actually also if you. For instance, also if you write a C extension, uh, but Ruby also does it internally, you can also yield the lock. And if you know you're running a piece of code that will not interfere uh, with these yeah, state-related problems at the VM level, uh, you, you can actually say, no, I have a piece of code um, uh, uh, that, that can run without the GV GVL lock. And, and that can then actually run in parallel uh, on a different CPU right, at the, at the system level. So, so this is totally possible. But it's not. It doesn't happen when you execute a normal Ruby program. Okay, uh, so that's the high-level overview of the. Um, actually, no, no. What? Let, let's actually, um, because then maybe because I think maybe the later things will be a bit easier to understand if I do that now. But let's look at the GVL a bit more closer now. Um, so, what is the GVL? It's just a mutex that it's uh, produced by calling to a P threads. So uh, it's 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 a lock um, that uh, you can uh, synchronize on, uh, and uh, to attach to the GVL is a is a wait queue. So basically, what happens is when you do like a thread dot like start a thread dot new, uh, uh, aside from creating that thread uh, and registering it with a kernel, uh, it will actually um, uh, cause the Ruby VM uh, to invoke its internal scheduling logic, and it will. Uh, uh, try to determine which thread uh, can run next. And, and this is essentially all boils down to seeing, um, well, who is waiting currently for, for this lock, right? So as threads start running, uh, the first thing they will do is they will try to claim the global VM lock. And this happens through this wait queue. So uh, to this wait queue, uh, there's a condition variable uh, attached. Um, like condition variable is just, yeah, something attached to, to a lock that um, 
where you can you can you can go to sleep uh, like a threat can go to sleep uh, uh, as long as this condition is not fulfilled right and as soon as it is fulfilled uh, through for example by a different thread um, it will get signaled so it wakes up uh, to uh, proceed running so they will all kind of um, try to uh, but they will they will all enqueue themselves into this uh, wake queue uh, and eventually uh, if uh, uh, yeah the, like Ruby uh, gets uh, scheduled again by the uh, Linux kernel if there is one there will always be one uh, thread ready uh, to actually hold the GVL that is called then the GVL owner <clears throat> uh, and that is the thread that will actually run but all of the other threads will be waiting behind that one thread waiting for this lock to be released uh, th that makes it also obvious if you do write a C extension uh, that does hold the GVL, which you might have to write it, because as soon as you do, like as soon as you do anything in a C extension that uh, calls into something like an RB underscore function, the, the, the RB underscore functions in, in, in the Ruby VM, they are usually bound to, um, they interact with the VM and they're usually even bound to a Ruby function in the standard, in the language library that you can call from a Ruby program as well. So, so for this stuff, you always want to lock the GVL, right? And, and that of course means that no other thread can execute. Um, so you need to make sure you unlock it again <laughs> as well. Um, yeah, so so that that's kind of how the the locking mechanism is uh, kind of uh, yeah, weaved weaved into this. Um, and so, but then like, and th this is, and th I think so far I always kind of had a fairly like this was kind of my understanding already, like how this kind of worked. But what always confused me was, well, wh what if I have two threads? Um, they do something like this, right? So they both just spin, like uh, they run an endless loop. Uh, so that's Ruby code, right? So they, they need the GVL, uh, and, but they never yield, right? So I, I just spin an endless loop. So 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 there must be a mechanism uh, that uh, makes sure that all of these thread, threads can run, right? B because we know uh, we know that uh, this this will not this will not be a blocking program, right? I can run this in Ruby and it will run fine. It, it's not like only thread one will run or only thread two will run. So there is some mechanism uh, that uh, makes sure that these both get um, uh, time allocated to actually run. And and this is completely a Ruby thing. This has nothing to do with uh, Linux uh, thread scheduling. Uh, and that's what's called time slicing in the Ruby VM. So that's what I'm going to talk about next because it's a bit complicated um, actually the idea is pretty simple so um, but implementation is not super straightforward but uh, ba basically what ruby does is um, it, it assigns a yeah a time slice to every thread uh, which it calls the time quantum and that's 100 uh, milliseconds so uh, it what it makes sure that every thread uh, that wants to run or uh, oh, actually no let me be very specific here because so that it, this is not understood this is not about um, uh, this is not about um, so all this is about is actually the time you're allowed to hold the lock. So this this doesn't really directly map to. I think that's a maybe that sounds like a nuance, but I think it's quite important. Uh, it, it, this is not directly tied to uh, like the time you've spent on CPU or something, right? Uh, Ruby does not measure that. That's the whole. It leaves thread scheduling completely to the Linux scheduler. The Linux scheduler might do something else entirely, right? So so this is really to solve lock contention, right? So that you do not have a single thread uh, blocking forever on the GVL and not yielding it. Um, so uh, yeah, so it's the time quantum. Uh, yeah, that's the scrolling bug that I mentioned earlier. <laughs> Sorry. Oops. Uh, so um, it's the time uh, a single thread is allowed to hold uh, the GVM block. Right. So how 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 do we do that? Uh, and actually, no, I'm going to show you a little example as well. Um, uh, I, I, I did this kind of for myself because I wanted to understand a bit better how to, how to see what's going on. So I have a super simple program. <laughs> this is, I think it's the one we used yesterday as well, uh, Alexei. Um, is it this one? Oh, yeah, so it's just a tiny little uh, script where um, I run two threads, the, the main thread. Um, uh, and, and an extra thread which should run currently, right? And and all they do is they spin, right? So we, we start a new thread and it spins in a while loop, so it never terminates. Uh, and and then I do the same with the main thread, right? So this is the method I, I run down here. <clears throat> Very simple. That's all it does. Uh, I name these threads so it's a bit more easy to see what they do. Uh, and 
to understand what was going on, uh, I, I played a bit with, um, with BPF. Uh, th this is the scripting language you can use to instrument basically any uh, like a C call of, of a library that you're using. And because Ruby is just a C library, uh, you can uh, uh, you can inject kind of your own little tracers into it. So it's quite simple. So it, what it does is it um, it just takes a couple current timestamp in nanoseconds. Um, <clears throat> Uh, just print some information here uh, and then we can register these probes so i registered the, these are basically method patterns in the uh, ruby vm so to watch for right so this is the stuff we trigger this block for down here so that's the action uh, so all i'm so all i'm doing here is i want to figure out um how how does this locking mechanism translate to actual time uh, spent uh, at the system level right on, on cpu basically so i I, I, I compute the time slice, right, uh, to see that happen. Uh, so, uh, all, so I, I, all I do is I just take the difference between this and, and print it here, right? So that's pretty simple, right? So if we, um, so if we run this, so this is the Ruby program that I run. It just prints its PID, and now now I have these two threads spinning, and then I can run uh, this. You always need to run it as as root because it needs some kernel level features. My, my cat is running on oh, my keyboard again. Oh, God. Okay, so um, I can stop it here because it just spins in an endless loop. So we can see here, um, so, so th this action block is triggered every time uh, one of these patterns matches, right, that I, that I uh, printed there. So the interesting bit here is, is this one. Uh, which is a uh, thread pointer execute interrupts. I'm going to show later what, what this does. Um, and we we print like the arguments that it received, uh, which I think is the thread pointer uh, and um, the time slice, right? Which is kind of when was this executed? And you can see it's, it's almost, it's not always exact, right? Here it's 99 milliseconds, but it's almost always exactly 100 milliseconds. So, so this is this kind of time slicing that you see happen at the Ruby VM uh, level. So um, yeah, so this this works. <laughs> it totally works. You can run as many endless loops as you like, uh, right? So if you um, look at then, I can't find my notes now. Yeah. So if we then look at um, how this is done, yeah, actually this is just FYI because if, if you want to look at this yourself, uh, there are actually two mechanisms by which Ruby enforces threads or forces threads to yield. Uh, uh, one is time slices. That's the GVL lock contention that I just showed you. And there's a whole completely separate mechanism called unblocking functions or UBFs. Um, and that's something different. It uses a, a, a signal uh, to, to interrupt uh, uh, these um, uh, sections. And one example for this was if you, if you, uh, if you run like a C extension, for instance, that, that does something uh, where um, where you do not hold the GVL. And if you do not hold the GVL, uh, you're not uh, putting yourself in the way queue. And, and then this whole time slicing stuff uh, doesn't work, right? So, so whenever you, there, there are like some cases, I think sleep is another one. I think Ruby, the way Ruby implements sleep uh, is, is by like um, signaling itself somehow uh, via an unblocking function. And uh, that's again, another thing where when you sleep, you don't hold a lock. Uh, through the GVL. So there, there are like some exceptions to where time slicing doesn't work. So that's why these UBFs exist to interrupt threads uh, every now and then uh, uh, to also, um, uh, yeah, uh, or allow them to, to terminate themselves as well. That might be another example. Right. So um, I already mentioned there is uh, the wait queue for the GVL that you need to uh, lock and uh, that threads uh, need to insert themselves into. It's called wait queue uh, in the VM. Makes sense. And um, yeah, so when the time th thread exceeds the time quantum, which is 100 milliseconds, uh, uh, something interesting happens because you might be asking yourself, well, how, like, who is timing what here? Uh, and, and actually, maybe let me start with the trivia. At, if, if I remember correctly, um, uh, and that's, yeah, you can have a look at this commit as well. I think this is where it happened. There was actually at some point a dedicated timer thread. Where, that Ruby would run where outside of your user level program threads, um, it would run a separate thread whose sole responsibility was to kind of uh, poke uh, in the Ruby VM, it says kicking other threads. 
<laughs> it's a, like this time of that would event like every 100 milliseconds it would kick other threads um uh, to to say kind of like hey uh you need to yield the gvl because there's other threads that want to run right as long as there's more than one uh entry in the wait queue uh but now uh, as of 3.6 uh, it's actually pretty clever how uh, ruby does that because it did away with the whole dedicated timer thread um and what it does instead is um it de it designates uh one of the user level threads uh to uh, uh to become the designated timer so basically if you have a thread that is waiting to be executed uh, it will kind of Take on that timer head, right? So, it, so it's like now the timer thread, uh, which has the kind of control over, uh, yeah, interrupting other threads uh, to to yield the GVL, so that we keep can maintain this kind of fairness, which I thought was a really clever, clever kind of little hack, actually. Um, yeah, and um, maybe we can now walk through the actual control flow to make this a bit more clear, like how these things happen. So. Uh, if you do something, if you do anything like thread dot, um, uh, like thread dot pass or thread new or thread dot start, like anything that kind of has some um, impact on scheduling, um, most of these paths in some way, shape, or form, they will end up in this GVL acquire method in in the Ruby VM, and this is where it locks the, uh, excuse me, <clears throat> the native uh, uh, p thread mutex. Um, yeah, and, and it then becomes the GBL owner or eventually will become the GBL owner. So it's kind of important to understand here that uh, the lock itself is not what defines uh, who is allowed to run Ruby code, but it's whoever's the GBL owner. And that's just a flag in the VM that uh, Ruby sets. Yeah, and, and most of this is implemented in this GBL acquire common function, um, uh, which only runs if uh, that lock is held so that we can actually update the wait, wait queue and make all of these changes. So then you have to just define, define or distinguish between two different cases. One is the GVL is uncontended, which is that which means that well, no one else is waiting for for that lock, right? So maybe there's only one thread, right? Because by default, if you run if you run Ruby and you know run a program, there's only one thread, the main thread. So all of this then becomes moot, right? There's no reason for you to wait for anything. Um, so that's the simple part. In that case, like it just resets the time slice, and you become the owner, and then you're done. Uh, but if there is another thread that currently owns the GBL, which means it might be on CPU, right? It might be scheduled. Uh, then you add yourself to the uh, uh, wait queue. Again, this is completely ignoring UBS. That's a totally separate thing. Um, and what then happens is it enters a, a loop uh, where, uh, because it kind of needs to keep checking, well, um, is there still a GBL owner? Um, and uh, within that loop, a couple of important things happen. The first thing is the timer thread designation uh, that I mentioned uh, just, just a minute ago, where we, we need to make sure that there's always one thread that takes on this um, responsibility, basically, right? So in, in this case, if there's no timer thread already, then the current thread, so whichever, whichever one is trying to uh, be the next GBL owner, uh, and, and you can think of that as the last thread in the wait queue, right? So if we if we have, if we go back to this, um, let's say you have like these two guys in here, uh, and then and a third one comes and tries to enqueue itself, uh, then this last one, because it's the one that wait needs to wait the longest, right, to uh, uh, execute, uh, it, it will become the timer thread. So yes, and, and this is where the actual time slice or logic uh, is enforced and and it doesn't really do much like all, because it doesn't need to do much right so all it does is um it blocks on this gbl wait queue condition uh with a timeout and that timeout is exactly the time quantum right so which means that um there are only two things that can happen here right uh either the either the um the lock contention is lifted right because a threat yielded uh or the time quantum expires right and that's maybe the interesting case so that would be the case with these two while loops that I just showed you, right? Because that those threads are not yielding like themselves, right? Um, and if that happens, uh, it goes into this function timer thread function, uh, where um, it, it sets a flag which kind of signals the VM to interrupt uh, 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 the currently executing thread. And I'm gonna talk about this later a bit because that's also a bit uh, a bit interesting, like how that's uh, implemented, right? So um, of course, otherwise we just block on the condition variable. Yeah, and th these are kind of the uh, 
the conditions uh, under which you can resume from this state, right? First of all, yeah, either you GVL release, that kind of makes sense. Um, uh, or of course, uh, a different thread has become the new designated new timer thread because they switch this role occasionally or, or the timer time zone. Yeah, and the way, so I guess like one open question here is, so, or any, any questions so far, does, does, that, does that make sense in terms of the overall flow? I'm just curious, do you think that it's stable to assign timer to a Ruby uh, to user created threads? Because from my perspective, having a dedicated thread is a bit more stable because we at least control that it will be alive. But when we always reassign timer, would it, shouldn't it create some sort of overhead? Like if we pop many threads in a row, that means that like each of them became a timer every time we pop a new thread, so a lot of overhead. It's just very subjective kind of feeling. I don't know how it's implemented, but... No, it's less overhead because you have one less thread you need to schedule. If you have a dedicated timer thread, you have an extra thread resource but, you can schedule and but, allocate resources. For. Yes. So it's more efficient. But you mentioned that the timer is the latest thread in the queue, right? Mm -hmm. So the responsibility of the timer there doesn't exceptions, mean... But that's... I think that's the default case. Yeah. Yeah, but that means when a new thread gets scheduled, we need to somehow reassign a timer role every time. I think so. Yeah, I think, I think I think that's I think that is what happens. Yeah. Mm. But for I mean, me, that sounds kind of complicated. What if it, like the thread will die? Oh, it's it, certainly. It's, it's like I, I'm not saying it's simple. <laughs> that's how I go. Yeah. Through. Okay. Okay. I'm not saying but it's simple. Overhead, that doesn't mean it's slow. Of, <clears throat> yeah, in terms of uh, amount of threads. Right, it's easily no, reduced. The, but that's the know. whole point. The amount of threads does not change. Uh, yeah. Because okay. all we deal with is user level threads. It's just, it's actually by design, it's very efficient, right? Because not only does okay. it not create a new thread, but it basically, like, what, what does a thread do that get, it enqueues itself in the wait queue? Well, nothing. It's, it's just wasted resources, right? A thread that waits for a lock condition is just wasted resources. That's all it is. It, because, like, you need, you need to maintain the memory. Uh, to uh, uh, represent that threat, right? So um, uh, I think it's actually super clever to say, well, we have an extra task that someone needs to do. So while this thread cannot run, let's just put it to good use. I think that's actually a very efficient mm. thing to do. Uh, I see. As, as for this, I think you may, might be referring to this loop that it enters, right? To um, I, I can't tell you, like you feel free to performance test that and <laughs> maybe you'll find it to be more efficient by not doing it every single time, but. I don't know. I, I didn't look into it in that level of detail, but um, I think I think from the general, um, I mean, does that make sense? Like that, you know. If you yeah, yeah, both, yeah. First yeah, of all, you have one thread less to worry about uh, and to allocate, uh, and you better utilize the resources that are already allocated anyway, right? I, I think to me that yeah. it sounds to me like a, a I, I don't know about performance improvement. That's about a, a res like using fewer resources to get the same job done. Maybe maybe that's a better way to phrase it. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks. Right. So um, so one question is still unanswered, and that is another thing that puzzled me for a while. Is okay. So we have this timer thread, uh, and then it uh, times out. But then what? So, so I, I got really confused when looking at this, that um, what Ruby calls interrupts, like th that's not really the same thing as being interrupted by a signal, for instance, right? Um, and that confused me greatly. Um, so because Ruby has this macro called Ruby VM check-ins, which is called, a, it's just a synchronous call into, um, into uh, a, a, another Ruby VM function. Uh, that actually, that's the one I just showed you. It's that's the macro for uh, RB thread pointer execute interrupts uh, with, with the time slice, or after the time slice. Um, but then the question is, well, when does it call that, right? Because if I have so so the timer expires, that means there's another thread spinning on CPU that I need to interrupt now. But how do I do that? And here again, it gets kind of clever, <laughs> uh, but kind of in a surprising way. Um, so what Ruby does is so this thread that is executing on CPU. It, it is interpreting, uh, it is running uh, Ruby bytecode, right? So we'll constantly, the VM will constantly go through um, VM execute instant or whatever it's called. And um, so it takes these bytecode instructions in YARV and uh, map it to Ruby calls. Uh, and if you look at, um, 
instance dev, uh, you can actually see that. Uh, so, so this is the they they came up with this um, definition language that can, you can use to map uh, uh, Ruby um, uh, bytecode instructions to uh, a, a VM call, right? Because that's all that Ruby is, right? So there's a bytecode language, and then uh, uh, th these bytecode instructions <clears throat> they are mapped to a piece of C code, basically, right? That the Ruby VM then calls. Uh, and as you can see here, for instance, um, deal with control flow, local jump. And if you look at what a jump is, and a jump is um, a jump is a, a loop, for instance, right? It, yeah, it it, it like moves the uh, instruction pointer somewhere else. Uh, you can also see this. Um, oh, how do you do that again? There's like a way, um, isn't it? Um, is it in Ruby dash debug or something? A dump? Is it dump? Yeah. Right, I've done it before. Um, <clears throat> so this is the bytecode for this while loop thing, right? So you can see here the loop, uh, where's the loop? So it will give you like, this breakdown byte function. So uh, that's a block and run thread. Somewhere there will be our, our loop and spin. Uh, da, da, da. I think it's this one. Yeah, so that's a spin function, right? So which, um, uh, which just calls while. And you can see here that while loop is actually a jump instruction, yeah? So it keeps jumping back to the beginning of the loop block. Uh, so that's all it does. Um, um, right, and that's this thing here. Right? So, so this, this bytecode here, on number four, uh, this is mapped to um, this uh, C block. Uh, and I don't actually know how the uh, interpreter or the compiler uh, at runtime does that. It probably just inlines that code. I, I'm not really sure. Uh, anyway, but um, so what it does is before it does the jump, it it calls this function Ruby VM check ins. So so if the timer thread has set uh, this flag uh, that other threads need to, or this or the current thread needs to be interrupted. So this is actually interweaved with all of these. Uh, I think it's only jump instructions, maybe some others where where it calls that because it doesn't call it that many times. I think four times is it's defined here. Um, yeah. So so this is where it does does that right. So in in this function it will then actually force the running thread uh, to uh, yield the GVL before it does the next loop iteration. Okay, does that make sense? All right. Oh, kid, she's hungry. So I'll try to. Yeah, we started late. Uh, I may need just five more minutes. Yeah, actually, honestly, maybe we can skip that because I think I actually talked about a lot of this. This is kind of just a control flow um, for. I took these notes for myself because I made it easier to wrap my head around it. But but basically, what happens is, um, yeah. So if in maybe you can do it super quickly. So in, in this uh, Ruby VM check-ins macro, um, what we do is uh, we just look at, uh, or we, we grab the current time slice, and then it's also adjusted based on thread priority because you can uh, also you can increase or decrease. Uh, the thread priority as, as a hint, and that can then actually in, increase or decrease the time slice, right? Uh, and then what we call is that's a pretty key function, RB thread schedule limits, um, which the, the limit here, or li limit S, I guess, is limit, limit slice or limit seconds. I'm not sure. The time slice is usually in milliseconds. Um, but anyway, th this basically says, like, wake up all of the threads uh, uh, and then sc schedule the next one, wh wh whoever's at the top of the uh, wait queue. Uh, and let it uh, let it run for 100 milliseconds. That that's all it does, right here. Uh, and and then the the caller of this uh, yields the GBL, right? That's super important because this is what will actually release the lock, so the other thread can 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 run. Uh, and then it also it, it then acquires the lock again. And what this does is it inserts itself back in the wait queue, right? This is how you get this rotation between threads in, in the wait queue. And then probably it will become the next timer thread. Yeah, um, that, that's pretty much that's pretty much it. Any uh, any questions? Oh, you actually, I, I don't know. Did I? I kind of forgot what you were asking in Slack yesterday, Alexi, because I might not have worked that in. I think you asked one question about um, like when to use threads or. Um, as opposed to a psychic job. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Something like this. I wanted it's a bit more like uh, practical. 
very practical question. So when do you think like it's a good place for writing thread new in your Ruby yeah. ordinary Ruby process? I mean, just I think from design perspective. Some, yeah, I mean, maybe there's some high level guidelines. I mean, that kind of depends on the case always, right? But I, I think of psychic always as kind of pretty heavy work to do. I mean, I mean, now you know that, that we've looked at this. Uh, it should be clear that um, uh, you you want to avoid GBL contention as much as you can, right? And um, <clears throat> uh, generally, like one way to think about it is um, what is the proportion uh, of time a thread would spend actually sleeping or actually running Ruby code, right? And uh, one and, and with sleeping, I mean, in general, um, not doing any work on the CPU. It could also be blocking on IO, for instance, right? That's like a super common thing in, in a web app because we, you know, we go to Redis, we go to Postgres. Um, there's a ton of IO happening. I can't actually tell you to what percentage our typical, that also depends on the request, but I don't know if we have any averages or percentiles for how, how that dist distribution looks like between how much do we spend on CPU versus uh, how much do we wait on IO? And, and that will also be different between uh, Puma and Psychic, by the way, right? That's why we have these different Psychic shards where like one is just for jobs that, are, that we know to be CPU bound. So they will need to run a CPU a lot. So we uh, need to allocate more CPUs versus uh, uh, IO bound. But, but generally, uh, I would try to keep any expensive work out of, uh, if we stick with Puma for, for a moment, um, out of Puma because, because of the GBL, you will contend with other uh, Puma workers that serve user traffic, right, um, on the GBL. So, like, you know, with the example that you've been working on with the JE Malloc reports, that's like not very, that is not the kind of work an application should perform. Uh, as, so, this must never interfere with user traffic and throughput, right, because it's really, uh, yeah, just diagnostic stuff and uh, we should not negatively impact use about this. So that, that's something where we need to be quite careful um, not to spend too much time on, on CPU. That's why we're looking at this right now, right? Uh, but I think it's an interesting example because that is something we cannot move to Sidekick, right? Because it is very specific to the process. That's uh, it, a bit of a catch-22 here because that specific job that we're executing, it needs to pull memory allocator stats and Sidekick cannot pull uh, you know, process metrics from something that runs on a different node, um, which, which is maybe also another argument if you have something that is kind of expensive and it doesn't really matter where it runs. So like anything that takes me more than a second or two, you know, I would con totally consider putting that on a psychic worker because even if, even if it's short and fast, yeah, that's good, you know, whatever. Uh, then um, uh, there's some overhead then, you know, with like going, like scaling it and Redis and waiting for psychic server to pick up the job. So there's always this a little bit of delay that you add. Um, but uh, it will it will just move it will remove like all of these expensive computations out of uh, out of the current the serving process, right? And related to this as well, if you have something, if you have the option, if you're deciding between okay, I could put this on the background thread um, because maybe it's not very computationally expensive, there can be another knock-on effect, which is that if you allocate many objects, um, this will trigger the GC, right? And the GC is a stop the world GC in Ruby. So it will, it will actually stop all threads, right? Uh, also the one holding, or, or, will, it will, or will, it will not allow to another thread to hold the GVL, maybe we should put it that way. Um, so that can be another knock-on effect, right? Where you basically steal CPU time indirectly, right? By causing Ruby to have, have a lot of cleanup to do. For instance, so that's something else to keep in mind. So you have something that is, yeah, very heavy on allocations, and that maybe doesn't need to necessarily happen, kind of in band, you know, with the user request. That's something else I would put on a on a sidekick job. But ultimately, it's always a use case uh, question, or even a product question, because there are things that we just need to happen very quickly, right? Or or um, maybe even as part of the same web transaction for the user experience to be consistent, right? Um, so, so then maybe you don't even have an option because, because if the request, let, let's say you want to compute something that you want to return in the response to the user, how would you do that with a psychic job even, right? Because uh, the web request will return before psychic is done and there's no communication between the two. So, so that's another limitation. So I think there's a whole bunch of trade-offs. It's hard to give like specific guidance there, but that's the kind of stuff I would usually think about. Maybe Nicola, if you have anything to add there. 
No, not really. I think you, you covered it. Uh, but I, I have a question, like from the perspective where they removed like the, that additional thread for just monitoring the timing, like we are using now the daemon for the memory killer, for example, in the recent example where we examined like the Puma and Sidekick. And especially for the sidekick memory killer, like previously, we used actually the sidekick middleware where we actually run the specific logic that, were, that was monitoring like the current process by executing that specific monitoring business logic in the end of every worker execution. And then we decided to like define a specific thread that will do just that. So like I didn't go into much details. Like I know that we decided that the daemon is better thing because it removes the overhead from the worker execution and because it was leading to, I don't know, false positives where we would blame that particular worker that caused like a, a lot of memory so usage, but that, that was actually not the case. It was not that worker to blame, but just the, uh, process I, memory was rich, but I, I just want to like hear your opinion. Like, So I, I this was like super early after I started at GitLab, so I don't have the full history here. Mm. Uh, I, I don't think I, I'm not even sure I've ever looked at the middleware memory killer in Psychic, but the way I remember the discussion uh, was that I don't think this has anything to do with pros and cons of threading, but if I, if I remember correctly what Camille said, uh, the reason the middleware is problematic is that uh, it only fires once, right? Like, or at very dis distinct points in time, uh, which is before and after a job executes. So if you have a job that runs for half an hour and it allocates a ton of memory, that memory killer is completely useless because it only fires before and after a job executes. So you cannot kill an ongoing job. That, that was my understanding why we put that on the background thread so mm. that we can run it concurrently to... Um, Every three seconds or whatever. Good, good that, that was my understanding of it, mm. but I, I, that's how I okay. remember. That makes sense. Mm, I also have one more question. Uh, uh -huh. Sorry, go. Okay. No, no, continue, continue. No, no, no I, I just want to conclude. Like, uh, I was just wondering, like, because we are creating another thread, but that Matthias' explanation makes sense. Uh, I didn't think about it. So, this would be from my perspective, maybe not well-formed question, but I wonder how like sleep inside threads should be pretty inexpensive, right? Because I mean, it's basically not wasting CPU cycles. It just checks that so, the yeah. thread is yeah. alive, but not wake, waken, awoken. So, but I wonder, so, so if you have like millions of threads that just sleep, so do you think like it would put an overhead on the, you know, all this scheduling meta yeah, system definitely. that would- Oh yeah, absolutely. Would, because because yeah, yeah okay. it's, it's resource overhead may be more than computational overhead, I would say, because- Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because like you just said, they, I mean, if they sleep, they don't do anything. Ah, but yeah, yeah. You, you're totally right because they will all uh, show up in, 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 you know, like these, whether it's a UBF handler, there's also, a, there's a separate list that will be locks um, where all of these UBF handlers are uh, inserted, right? So whether that's, Handled by UBF signal or uh, or 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 a GBL GBL wake queue somewhere they get scheduled right so so yeah if you create mm -hmm. millions of threads uh, I, I would um, I haven't actually done any any testing around this but I, I would I would not expect Ruby to perform well like in in that sense that's actually I think it's a really great question though because that's actually the kind of the bit that they, they, yeah that's like really yeah it's like one of these traditional trade offs right because um, threads give you the, um, forget about Ruby for a moment, but in general, threads give you this powerful tool that allows you to parallelize um, with some computation. Um, but of course, there's always an extra cost attached. So you, at the end of the day, you always need to, you can go overboard with this, right? Uh, so you need, to, you, you need to size your thread pools properly, right? Uh, for, based on uh, the number of CPUs you have, but, but, but not just that, it's also uh, uh, with every thread that you introduce, um, uh, every time the Linux scheduler uh, switches between a thread, that's a context switch, right? So it needs to 
perform and this was short in the system and the time spent in the kernel right so it, it, there's work to do for the for the operating system um, to schedule all of these threads so that's another level of of overhead and and this is the area where modern languages like go try to um, improve on this because uh, go uses this combination of um, what you call green threads right sometimes uh, which are called go routines in, in Ruby uh, sorry in go um, uh, where there is there is a threat pool uh, somewhere in the background, but the programmer never sees that. You, you don't schedule stuff on threads and go, right? You 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 schedule some uh, like the at, at the programming level, your level of abstraction is the go routine. But um, the scheduler in in go is is uh, very efficient between um, yeah time slicing these go routines uh, on 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 just a few a very small number of threads, and and you can configure that like how many threads do you actually want to run but uh, the go runtime will um like schedule like easily thousands or even millions of go routines on on a much much smaller number of threads and kind of yeah multiplex uh, between them to to get rid of uh, uh uh this extra overhead that you would otherwise get from running all of these threads natively right so so yeah that's another way to think about it maybe yeah, makes sense. Thank you. And then with rectors, it will get even more complicated, right? Because they, uh, I haven't looked at the implementation yet, but as far as I understand, they hold their own GBL lock. So there are some things that they can actually do in parallel. So where uh, they can get scheduled um, on multiple cores simultaneously, but they are limited in, in what they can do. Uh, and uh, last I checked, but that was a while ago, um, I think it was even one of the core developers, Koichi-san or uh, Matsumoto, I forgot, but one of them, they did a performance test of a fairly simple program, like, excuse me, one, one being um, a CPU bound workloads, right, and, and just uh, spawning a bunch of uh, threads, and uh, he implemented it in, with Rectus uh, uh, in one program, and with just normal Ruby threads uh, that would, like, contend on the GVL and the other thread, and I think he actually found that uh, the Rectus solution was slower. Uh, be, yeah, be, because there's also communication overhead between records, right? Because you need to uh, dispatch messages between the message queues, and there's a lot of like extra bookkeeping um, and like yeah, juggling data around at the VM level that needs to happen for records to cooperate. Um, so, so he found that there were actually cases where it wasn't faster or even slower, um, despite being able to paralyze some of them that work. Which I thought, yeah, you know that. Yeah, it's uh, it, it's kind of surprising, and, uh, but it just goes to show like there's all all these trade offs you need to uh, consider, right? And so so maybe maybe Rectus will be. I, I mean, I would expect that they will get improved as well in performance, and maybe they have already. But um, I, you know, you you sent the Shopify article around, right? I mean, what the person concluded there was it's probably going to be a while until we see that actually being used in in practice. He's probably right about that. Um, all right, um, I got a, I got a break here. I think uh, it's it's been a little over an hour now, but I, you know, considering <laughs> the technical problems, I made a fit. Um, cool. I mean, we can we can always catch up uh, later as well with other questions. But th thanks thanks so a lot. Much. This was very extensive and. <laughs>